and the, the little picture of the bears, that's that, that the picture is that on the bottom of that gravestone, so that's where the picture of that comes. It's been a long battle to try and find out who I really are. I was interested to see psychologically how it would affect me. They're meant to be putting us in the soil, not the other way around. Gary, how are you, mate? I'm fine, thanks. How are you, mate? Yes, it's good to finally meet you. We chatted, God, it must have been over a year ago. Yeah, I think it was just before when I, when I was doing the book, actually, just before it came published. I mm. got in touch with you, actually. Uh, I thought it must have been over a year ago, definitely, because the book came out last March. Yeah, so yeah it, how's, it, how's it been doing? It's, it's been... On Amazon, uh, I mean, there's over 100 positive reviews on it, which is brilliant. To be honest, uh, I, I couldn't expect anything more. I, I would, I'd have been pleased if I got 10 when I first wrote it. So it just seems to have got more and more and more. And it's just getting all that to try and promote it and things, really. You know. Have you found um, that it takes, it's two different kind of arenas. There's one arena of being an author and there's the other arena that, of your story. Um, yeah, it's it's kind of strange. Yours is your book's different from mine in in as far as I can sort of laugh off all my history and put it down to experience, and and yeah. and it really doesn't sort of you know I wouldn't sort of change it for the world. But when you lose two daughters. I mean, I'm not even going to try to pretend I could get my head around that. Um, God, I'm feeling emotional just talking about it because uh, I remember when when Jenny was pregnant, the only thing on my mind was just like, please, please don't let there be anything. Yeah. Um, and it... it it wasn't until we went through that nine months that I'd ever been put in a position, Gary, where I'd had to think, how must it be for parents who lose a child? Yeah. Well, and, and to lose a child in, in pregnancy is, is not, not equal. We, we can't, we can't put a, judgment on it but you get what i'm trying to say it, it's um it, it's just a massively overlooked area in society i mean i i've i've i mean my my aunt had three miscarriages right yeah and when you're a kid and you hear about this it's oh there's a three yeah. you don't yeah. realize that no that's you make a bond with each one of those lives and it's so special to you. And there's just so much, so much more to it. Yeah. And your, your, your daughters, am I saying this correctly? It was Alana and Dana. Yeah, Alana and Dana. Yeah. yeah. And they, they lived for how long, Gary? It was less uh, than a Alana long. lived for three days and Dana lived for 26 days. Uh, I think just saying that we've got two audiences out there now. We've got parents and non-parents. Yeah. Not saying that non-parents can't have empathy or, or, or are not yeah. extremely kind people, but I just think every parent thinks, my God, there by the grace of God go us. No, I, 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 I think for me, Chris, and I know we chatted way, way back, but I think because of my life and how I led my life, and obviously I'd, I'd, I'd written my life story, that was that was the book that was going to come out. And I think it, w it wasn't until 
2014 when my wife was diagnosed with cancer. And what she did every year was go around all her family on their birthday and deliver birthday cakes. You go early in the morning and put birthday cakes on all the doorsteps. Selfishly, Chris, and, you know, and it's, a, it's a bit shameful. I, I wouldn't have anything to do with it. I didn't want to talk about my daughters on their birthday or anything like that. I just wished I could go to bed the day before and wake up the, the, the day after. That's how my head was, really. And I was struggling with my own mental health battles the way back. But this year, because she had the cancer, she couldn't do it, which was in 2014, so I had to do it. So I remember getting the cakes and things, and I went round to the, the uh, Michelle's family's doorsteps and put it down. But it kind of broke me in a way. I came home, and Michelle's got memory boxes for Alana and Donna. So I took them. Where I'm sitting now is my council room, but I've got like a self-defence studio behind here. So I took them all into a lead and, and started reading them. And I just cried and cried and cried, read all the cards, the kind people who actually, you know, wrote and even just to see their baby grow. So they're just, they wouldn't fit in the hand because that's how small they were. And it, 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 it just, the emotion just poured out, to be honest, which it needed to, because I'd suppressed it for, you know, nearly 14 years, really. Yeah. Uh, and that's how I thought I'm going to have to write to Michelle and try and I hadn't had the words to communicate it, to write what I've been going through myself all these years. So I started writing and then I went to see Michelle and says, this is, this is, this is what I'm, I'm wanting to do. And we kind of said, why don't you write a book? Because there's obviously lots of dads out there, you know, and it wasn't just for dads, to be honest, Chris. I, 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 that was in my head, but I, I kind of really thought about it more. It was more for partners as well. It was for medical teams and things to try and understand what dad's going through. You know, I'm a st stereotypical northerner. You know, you keep your emotions built in and you just crack on and you crack on and you crack on. But to what effect to my wife, what effect to myself and different people like that, really. Uh, so we came up with the title, Daddy and the Two Bears, because we always called them our little bears. And kind of from the Goldilocks and the Three Bears, there was a little ring from that, really. So then, obviously... We, we put the book together, got it edited, and, and, and it came out in March last year. So it's, it's it, for me, the big thing, Chris, was always about it. It gives you hope. doesn't matter what, you know, you, you'll have had your own dark times and different things like everybody has. It just gives you hope. And that's what I like to think people get from it. It's, it's you know, no matter what life throws it, you can get through it. Yes. They say time is a great healer. I, I, I guess it has to be. Otherwise, how how could we go on? I, I, don't, I don't know. I, I don't know if it heals you. I can only speak for me on. It's. I know it's let allowed it out, and when, when you look at the front page of the of the book, I mean that might represent different things to different people. The hands represent me. Actually, that's me letting actually letting go now. I think I kept. The, the hurt inside for so long because I want to keep my daughters inside as well, if that makes sense. Mm. So that feeling that I was still with me, even though it was hurt, they were still with me. And that's me finally letting go. That's what the hands represent. And that was this staircase to heaven, if you, if you believe in that. Uh, and the, the little picture of the bears, that's that, that the picture is that on the bottom of that gravestone. So that's where the picture of that comes um, yes. And how have you been able to let, 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 let go, G Gary? Was there any single, any single factor, or has it, it has it been a process? I think it's been a process. I, I, I'm quite a physical person, so every year since I died, I always raise money for charity, either for. Baby loss charities and things, you know. I, you know, I do the the coast to coast. I've done, and I'm doing the, the Cleveland way this year. So I, I'm going to try and do that in three days. I try and put myself under lots of pressure to do things, but that helps me as well. It's that that's that it's that mindset, and I'm actually doing it for my daughters as well. So every time I'm doing something, it's for Lana and Donna, you know. And yeah. Yeah, I'd, um, my most recent challenge, I ran 100 miles along the coastal path. Yeah. And it's the first 
charity challenge I've done that's not been for veterans or not been for veterans' mental health. And I did it um, for a little girl that's recovering from a brain tumour. Oh, bless. And uh, I, I was interested to see psychologically how it would affect me doing such an extreme challenge, but for a different, you know. Yeah. Charity. Yeah, I, I I do a lot for veterans, and obviously being a veteran, there's a, a strong connection there. But the truth is, is that, like I say, when Jenny was pregnant, that had such an effect on me. Yeah. You know, and I just, Jesus, I feel so fortunate that we've got to where we're at with... Um, you know, there's always a few complications along the way. I think it's the nature of life, but yeah. compared to what you guys went through, geez. Um, and I just wanted to acknowledge, you know, I wanted to uh, acknowledge that. And yeah, um, I mean, I, I, I'd like to do something. I'm sure you you can help me out here, but there must be, I, I I know that your daughters live for a few days, but the, there must be charities that support parents that either lose a child during pregnancy or, or shortly after. No, there's quite a few. I, 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 I uh, you know, I, I done one last year. I, I done, you know, I do like I say, I do a lots of walking uh, to raise it and, and tough guy events and different things like that. Uh, and I think over the years, I, pro- I think Michelle said it was over thirty-five grand I've made for you know certain char- charities and things like that. And I'll I'll, I'll keep doing that till as long as I can walk and things. If I can't walk, I'll I'll push or something. I'll I'll do something every year because it's it's my it's it's it's, it's, it's my, my thing as a dad, and you know that that's what I feel I need to be doing. And you know I'm I'm fifty-six now, so but it still doesn't. I still push myself hard to, to achieve things. And and I think if you look at as much as you, if you can take anything positive out of this, Chris, which is really hard to, to say that, I've turned my life around massively since my daughter's died from the character I was to who I am now and what I do. So I, I, it just drives me to do good. And that's not a being wishy-washy sort of thing. It's just... That, that's who I am and I just want to do good for people whether that's mental health bereavement and, and that sort of stuff really because it's, it's my it's my life I've lived and breathed it mm. so I just want to put something back yes because when you come to this table we we bring all our own you know we've got our own histories haven't we did I no. gather from the book um, I had to read it really really quickly yeah some would say a skim skim read. Apologies for that, Gary. But oh, no, that's okay, um, mate. Uh, uh, just like I say, there's probably more than fifty books on my shelf. And um, when I started my podcast, I had this kind of deluded idea that every guest that was an author, I'd read and research their book. And and the notion. I mean, I've done three podcasts in one day before. Yeah. The notion that I could read three books in a day is uh, was a bit um, bit ambitious, let's say. But but I did make time because I, you know, this uh, this is an area that's special to me, obviously. And um, I mean, it's a it's a book. It's 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 like a book. It's nine months, Chris. If you look at it that way, it's it's it, where there's. You'll, when you do, if you do get a chance to read fully, you'll see that the, the battle I was having with mental health, with alcohol, and all, and all that comes into that book. Although that you'll, you'll learn more about that in my life story and my background in security and things and, and all that stuff. And you know, you know, sadly, I've, I've not been the nicest person in the world. And when I, and hence, you'll read in the book as well. It'll say, I believe what happened was because of my past. I had to go through that as well because. I was taught as a young boy, my granddad was a very religious man, and he says, whatever you do bad, something bad will happen to you. He always believed that. 
So I was dealing with that part as well, thinking this is all my fault. Michelle's such a lovely woman. She, you know, she wouldn't park and double your lines, Michelle. She's such a, you know, she's just a lit proper lady. Then mm. she's ended up with me, all my mental health problems, being under a psychologist, then obviously getting yeah, pregnant, but she was just over the moon and sadly losing them, you know. Then she's getting cancer. It's just been one, almost one thing after another. But the thing what 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 we've been able to do, which I can imagine some parents will find it hard, we've stuck together, you know, and it is difficult at times, especially now I'm as a man and who I was, I didn't want to chat about all these things. Uh, whereas I do sit with them now, I still find it hard, Chris, but I can talk about it more. And I, that's because of the book, to be honest. And doing talks like this, it just helps. It's helping me and I'm hoping that helps somebody who wants to listen to it and, you know, and it's for me to put myself out there, whereas I've always kind of been below the trenches. I'm, I'm kind of, I'm putting myself out there. I'm very uncomfortable doing it, but I, I want to do it as well at the same point, Chris. Mm. Uh, and that's that's my goal in life. I'm just going to put my, my story out there and, and hope that helps somebody. I'm sure it will. Well, I know it will, Gary. And now we've all got histories, haven't we? we we're all on this journey that we have that awakening, don't we? We don't realise what we're like. Yeah. We just think that's us. That's, this is our, you know, our dead. we are, isn't it? Yeah. And then something happens that makes you look back and reflect and think, oh, well, perhaps this isn't the help, most helpful behaviour. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and we start to get, try and get on an even keel then. Yeah. No, I mean, uh, I mean, if I'm going off the tangent, just tell me. But I know when I met Michelle, it was it was on my birthday in 1999, and I was going over overseas. My friend it was a friend of a friend was a mercenary overseas, and where my head was then, I was just going over there and just wanting somebody to put a, a, a bullet into my head. That's all I was, and I went down to Cleethorpes. So I, I didn't know Michelle at the time, but my old boss uh, was down there, and he was having trouble with uh, drug dealers. So we went down to the pub you know, to, to sort these drug dealers out. And Michelle and her friend was in the pub. And basically, that day, them drug dealers ran off. But I sat, stood there with Michelle, and a year later, I was married to Michelle. And for what, she, you know, I went into counselling. It didn't work for me. And I was under the psychologist for eight years, battling with that. I, you know, I went down to nine stone and weight, and I'm, I'm a 14 stone plus bloke. Couldn't leave the house with anxieties and things. And, and it was so shameful, you know, really shameful for myself. And I know it's not, but that's how I felt. You know, the embarrassment this supposed to be tough guy was actually really struggling with his demons and things from his past and that. So, you know, for as much as the book is about me and, and my little girls, it's it's about Michelle because she she to me is just an, an absolute, she's an angel to be to be honest in my eyes, you know I don't believe in coincidences I believe in fate and I think that was you know and I do really believe in that I know some people might think that's a lot of crap but I do really believe in that you know. Yeah, uh, well, everything happens for a reason. You can say def definitely in my eyes anyway, Chris, one hundred percent. I can kind of see the path of that me when I look back on it. You know, this is why this happened. This is why this happened. This is why this has happened. And let's not forget, mate. She she obviously sees a lot in you. She's fallen in love with you, and that's um, yeah. that's all credit to you. She probably, she's probably said a few times. I don't know how late, like, but no, nah, she, she's she, she, she's golden, like, and you know, absolutely darling. Yes, hence the expression "the my better half," isn't it? Yeah, I think we all feel like that. <laughs> no, I think you know, you, you, you know, the, the background you've got and the background I've got. You do meet a lot of men's men and things, and and actually, when you get and I'm, you know, I'm a counsellor now, but you know, when you're sitting with people and you peel it all apart and you get really to the nitty gritty, the things where people have come from, and it usually is from childhood the environment they're in and things like that, isn't it? And it's not hard to understand why somebody's doing what they're doing. Yeah. Uh, Yes, and I think the the thing that this awful wave of veteran suicides has highlighted is 
some of these guys in battle were the most ferocious, toughest men you ever could come across i mean they've all passed the commando course for a start yeah. but if you haven't got it right up here yeah you know and, and you've got to have your house in order and you've got to be able to deal with the challenges that life throws at you especially if you've been on the front line and you've seen you know you've seen some extremes um doesn't matter what the outward appearance is does it if if it's oh. Just one switch up here could mean that you're you're a broken. No, I, you know I've I've been there. I, you know I, was, I remember my, my mother was living with this fella and he bought me a motorbike for my birthday. Sixteen, I uh, was sixteen year old and I had enough of life then. I didn't really know about mental health and things like that. I just know I'd had enough of life then. And I remember I decided in my head was I want to see who turns up to my funeral to see if anybody actually likes me. That's that's how my head was. And it was in some ways it's a bit a little bit of a funny story. I, I, was, I lived right on the A1, and I thought I came to the junction. It was a crossroads, and I seen the wagon coming down, so I went back. And the 50 cc trying to get as fast as I could, which was probably 30 mile an hour. I missed the wagon, and I, and I remember the car had the Mark II Escort. Uh, and I remember waking up, I knocked myself out, and, and and my first thought, I can't even do this right, you know. And that, that's how my head was. Mm. Uh, I didn't, I didn't know that people just call you crazy and, you know, I don't really like that word. But for me, that was mental health then and, and further back, I, I can see where it all comes from now, just through my own therapy, really, you know. I'm guessing you had a bit of a challenge in childhood, Gary. No, I did. I, I was, uh, you know, I, I was born into a family that they didn't love each other. They were, you know, in the 60s. Mm. If you got pregnant, people got married, didn't they? <laughs> Whereas nowadays, and, and you know, and rightly so, you don't you don't need to do that now. Uh, but the stigma comes with it, isn't it? And, you know, I was I was abused not of my mum and dad, uh, but I was abused of Sunday, and and even that, the effect that had for the rest of my life, mm. it's just just incredible. I was self destructive. I was I, I had to have alcohol to cope with my demons, and and actually, when I had too much alcohol, the demons came out. So it was all that constant battles, to be honest, Chris. And it's, uh, it's just, and I've done a lot of harm to people, which you can't change, Chris. And I have, I've got to take that to my, to my grave, that one, like, you know. Yeah, I'm a great believer in, I, I put a line there, and the past is the past, that's it. Yeah. I'm very clinical about, I've done that in situations where people have died in front of me, and I'm just like, that's the past. I don't care if it's just happened a second ago. Yeah. But it's irrelevant to me. It's, yeah. it's, um, I think when you've experienced depression, you can't afford to go there again. No, it's, it's, there's, no, there's nothing to be gained from it. There's nothing to be gained from living on a bloody sofa bed in front of the telly for 18 months. There's nothing. And no. my way to deal with it is I, I just, I literally draw a line. This, yeah. Take take the lessons from it, and that's it. Yeah, and 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 it's good you can do that, Chris. That sadly, some people can't, you know, and that, and that's the thing. It, it's strength of your character, but that doesn't mean to say that other people aren't strong. And for me, I, I honestly, you know, this is the truth. I never wanted to end my life. I just couldn't live with my life. I just struggled. <laughs> I couldn't sleep at night for nightmares. I had alcohol to help me sleep. So it was, it was just that, you know. Uh, every relationship I had that failed because of self-destructive in it. And it's just, and because deep down I know I'm a nice, well, I know I'm a nice person, but then I know deep down I hated what I was. So I, I always believe, well, I must be a nice person or less I wouldn't be ashamed, you know. But again, it didn't stop me getting into trouble with the police. I ended up in jail and things, you know. So it's, it's. I learned later on in life. I was diagnosed with ADHD. And when you when you look at that, and you look at my patterns, apart from the complex trauma part of it, I can see why I did things as well, you know. So it's it's it kind of it's all started to make sense to me really. But it's it's been a long battle to try and find out who I really are. Mm. Yeah. I should point out, Gary, for me, um, it, 
if people are out there thinking I'm some sort of psycho, it's no, it's it, it it's absolutely not that. Uh-huh. It's that when I came through addiction, I could see that so much of what we're taught as human beings and, and our culture and old wives' tales and superstition and uh-huh. and 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 uh, the 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 morbid culture that we have around death etc except that it doesn't do us any favors no and i had to reteach myself all of that stuff whilst living in that culture i.e you know uk culture yeah and i realized that there was stuff that it it didn't have to be that way so you know, this thing that if someone dies, you've got to grieve, you've got to be miserable, you've got to blame yourself, mm-hmm. you know, you've got to wear black to the few. I, I, I just rewrote all that. I said, sorry, yeah. I'm, 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 I'm not doing it. Yeah. I mean, okay, there's bits in you are tied so much into that conditioning that, that it, it, it's a work, you know, you've got to put effort in. But I think it was just through my own survival and not wanting to always live in pain. Yeah. You know, that I just rewrote the book, Gary. That's all it is. It's, it's not that I was born with any kind of callousness or coldness or, um, you know, I remember looking at my mate's dead body and thinking, what, what would he want for me? Yeah. Um, you know, he literally just died on our holiday, drowned on our holiday and, and, I could have gone down the route of, oh, woe is me, and oh, I blame myself. And d- and I just decided that I'm not doing I'm I'm not doing that. What yeah. would he what what would my mate Lee want? He'd want me to go on and smash my life and have a great time. That yeah. is it. So that's what I'm gonna do. And um yes, I I I saying this, folks, I just hope it can help somebody, you know, not not to buy into that. The tradition, because I think the tradition is, I think it's there purposely to keep us all miserable. Yeah, I, I, kind of, I, I know my background, obviously, it was just just the family. Uh, it's not necessarily bad people. My dad's dead now, but he, it's, it, was their, it was their background as well. And it was their background. It just felt, felt us through generations. And, you know, dads then were, you know, they were, for me, anyway, they were scary people. You know, it was, I was scared of my dad. Yeah, he gave you the belt and things. He showed no emotion. But bless him, he probably had his own demons from just passed down. You know, I can, I can look now at that. Whereas when I was younger, I hated the man out of passion. But I, I, I'm in a better place now, and I can un- understand. You know, my, my mother threw me out of the house when I was 16, and I went to my dad's. And I said, Dad, I said, Dad, I need help. And I remember my, my dad's words stuck with me. You're a man, son. And I knew what he meant. So it took me to 33-year-old, causing lots of trouble and the people, myself, meeting Michelle, to decide, OK, I'm going to have to do something about this because I know I can't live any longer. So that, that was it. But that was because my dad said that word, you're a man, son. And I know what he meant. Gary, did it set you back with your mental health. So you're, you, you were having therapy, you're, you're making progress. Yeah. And then you, you had this challenge to deal with. Did that yeah. set you back massively or did it, were you in a better position to cope it, with it? It set me back, Chris. I, I was, it was funny, I was speaking to Michelle about this last night before I came on and, you know, and I had, to, uh, you know, I explained to her when, when Donna died, because Donna was in another hospital uh, 50 miles from Birmingham. So Michelle was there and I had to travel up every day. And when I got there and Donna got, she was getting really well and she was getting moved back to uh, Birmingham, where, where I live now. And she got a t- tummy bug. There's more to it. But just It was a bug in her tummy and she died within 24 hours. We've been told she was better than being told she's not going to live. Just got to it. But I remember... Michelle's family there and some of Michelle's friends and, and I can mind walk and still see myself walking through the corridor. I couldn't even, I, I didn't want to acknowledge anybody. I got into the car 
And I remember going down the, the motorway, I think it was the M54, if I remember, I might be wrong there, down the motorway. And I, I know I've seen myself, if a shell wasn't here, I'd just go across the motorway. And, and that's where my head was. Obviously, get home and it's, it's just it's just not a nice place. It's the last place you want to be, to be honest, Chris. Uh, Michelle went to her mum's and that, and I just, I just, I just wanted to, my life to end there and then. I thought, because I, I believe then it was my fault. Uh, but as time went on and I started to stick to my therapy, and I was, you know, I was eight years under that psychologist, Chris, and we moved to Birmingham, and I used to travel twice a week to Cleethorpe, so Grimsby it was, which is 135 mile there and 135 back. I would travel twice a week for my therapy. I never missed a session. When the psychologist moved up to East Kilbride, I would go up to East Kilbride from Birmingham. You know, I just wanted to find out who I really was. Mm. I don't know if this makes sense, but that's what I, that's, that was the hardest battle. As many, many battles I've had, that was, that was the hardest battle was with, with myself, that, that one. And somewhere on the line, I started just looking at life. I'd been a bodyguard in a sense, but not, not to the nice people. So I wanted to change all that round, really. Uh, I started studying. I went into counselling. I'd done two years as, as a, to train as a counsellor, but I wasn't ready for it, so I stopped it then. Then I went to work in children's homes where kids had been abused and things. Kind of learn it from a sense of a staff member and, and learn from the children as well and see what they were going through as well, what resonates with my background and things. And all them children I've ever met over the years, Chris, well, it's obviously none of them deserved to be there. They've just been dealt a shit hand like I had at that time, born into the wrong family and people around in the environment. So that, I, I, I packed that in. I went and worked with the homeless because I'd been homeless. Then I packed that in, went and worked with the alcohol and uh, drug addicts, the, probably the most extreme ones on the streets and that. So I did I did that for a couple of years. So I was learning these skills, picking up qualifications as I went. I left, well, I got thrown out of school at the end left school with no qualifications. Then I, I worked for an Irish welfare and I loved this job, Chris. I absolutely loved, loved this job. I would go out and pick alcoholics up and take them to hospital, try and fight the corner to get them into uh, detox and then get them ready for rehab and things like that. And sadly, in 2010, uh, that, you know, the, the country wasn't in a good place. I lost my job. So then I went back into the body garden again uh, Went to Africa, worked in Uganda uh, for a long time. Then went to Libya when the war was on. Then from that went to Afghanistan. Uh, but when I came back from Afghanistan, I think it was 2000, and, beginning of 2012, I think it was, I put myself back into college again to finish my counselling off. And through that, you know, I was cleaning toilets, you know, cleaning shit off people's toilets just to make it ends meet, doing the, doing the doors just to, to get that extra cash in the hand and things. Uh, then just start building on things and I, and I developed my own programs for schools and I had this idea, I put all my security background, all my life experience, all the stuff I've learned working with different people over the years and developed these programs called Safeguard Me. So it was me going into school, uh, working with 10-year-old kids, which I just absolutely love, Chris. And seeing even at that age, Chris, because I can pick up on things quite quickly, the demons they were having, even about asking for help, you know, all them things. So I have about 50 stories. So I go in, and the character's called Little Billy. Some of them are my stories, and some of them are children I've worked. So I've made stories up, but they're all based on true stories. The kids love it, and it allows the kids to speak up as well. And I take a box with me, and they write down any problems I've got, and I put the box in, in the box. You know what, Chris, over the few years I've done that in the schools, which is it's heartbreaking, but kids have came forward saying they've been getting abused and things like that. So then the right people get involved and things like that. Sadly, COVID came and just sliced that all away, took all my work away. So then I developed the thing where I'll do online counselling. So somebody had helped years ago, their daughter, she got in touch with me who, who ran a big company and I started working kind of part-time with them, just counselling on screen because obviously the mental health part. And I've just started to get back into the schools. Now delivering the safeguard me. But I'm trying to try and make that into a book as well, Chris. So it's a book mentors can have, teachers can have, parents can have. And it's everything from self low self-esteem, exploitation, knife crime, gangs, all that stuff. 
but at age appropriate for 10 year olds, you know. Uh, so I, I really try and do, it does sound really wishy washy, but I do really try my hardest to do good to help people. Like that's just my nature. No, I think it's really affirming, Gaz, because, um, you know, we got to trust in this God or whatever it is up there. Yeah. This bit, this, because it's all for a reason. And you wouldn't be doing this diamond job now with the kids. I couldn't do it, Chris. <laughs> yeah. If you hadn't had these real tough experiences. Yeah. Um, it's like for myself, when peop people have said, oh, he's really turned his life around. Yeah. And I'm like, you know, when they talk about like mistakes of the past, and I get it, Gary, of course I get it. But the thing is, when you, like, my son's a gorgeous little kid, right? I'm just honored sorry it's probably not appropriate to be bigging my son up but but um you know he, he's just everything right he's the most handsome kid that ever was created he's the funniest the kindest the most loving yeah and and like i wouldn't have had him had I not been through all these experiences that took me up to meeting his mum. Yeah. You actually met his mum. We were drug workers. Yeah. Couldn't have been doing that job had I not had the experience of my past. Yeah. And so when people say, oh, you did it wrong, I say, no, I did everything right. <laughs> yeah. It just didn't seem like it at the time. Yeah. Um, no, I, 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 when I'm listening to you there, I 100% 100, 100 get it. I didn't used to get it, but I do over the past few years, you know, like working on myself and that I, def I definitely get it because if I was a counsellor and never had a, a, any experience, I, I know personally I couldn't work with that person. That's just how I counsel. So when I counsel somebody, they have to have almost something that I've went through so I can recognise it because I, I'm kind of more of like a life counsellor, if that, if that kind of makes sense. Although I've got all the, the theories in that, I just work, whatever comes in the door, I just work with. And what I usually do is I go out for a walk. I'm, I'm near a place called Sutton Park. So we'll go down there. I'm away for a walk and we'll sit in the lake yeah, next to on a, on a thing. So I do that. I do my counseling through self defense. You get blokes coming and half an hour doing the pads and different stuff. Then I just sit down and just have a chat like this, Chris. But I'm actually working with them at the same time. But it's just making it like a chat. And that's how I kind of do it, really. I'm definitely not an academic counsellor. I have to work hard because I'm not there uh, to qualify for things. Uh, uh, it's massively overlooked, isn't it? The, all the fight clubs, whether it's martial arts or boxing, yeah. they do a great job with, with, with people, don't they? Massively, because well, why does anybody want to take up self-defence? They're just interested in it, but a lot of people come because of maybe their own background and something's happened and things. And so it's, there's usually, as much as they're coming, they're bringing issues in with themselves. Uh, so that's that's what I kind of do, and just make it like a self-defence session and a chat and the same with my counselling. You know, I do Reiki now and you know, all them things. I'd, as a, a young lad, I thought, God, that's poncy and poofy and gay and all that, which is wrong. But that's how I thought a counsellor was like, you know. Yeah, but it's, it's not, you know. Yeah, it's the opposite, isn't it? If you want to be a, war a warrior in life, you've got to have the skills. Yeah, yeah. Life can be a battle if you if you don't have these skills. No, uh, yeah. you know, and you know, I like I, I I like I love being away in the outdoors, and you know, if I could get out there more, just you know, I'm quite happy in my own little little world. To be honest, I like just being. Just going for walks, whether it takes three days or ten days, I just, I, I just, I'm at peace there. That, that's my antidepressant in a sense. Mm. Just being an outdoors, it works for me. That I, I don't need the medication. Although I've, I've been pumped for meds before, but that just helps me. That that just being outside in nature, you know. I, I think it's it needs to be promoted more, really, from doctors and things like that. You know, yeah. I think it's important. 
What was it like when Michelle found out she was pregnant? With the, the twins, mm. it was just over the moon because we didn't think we could have children because we'd been trying, you know, for a while. Uh, it's just, I just remember coming in from work and she was there with this golden box and she opened it and obviously the pregnancy test, it just over the moon because... Again, I, I have a son up north, but sadly, just the kind of person I was, I kind of walked away from from that when I was, you know, and I've got to live with that one as well. But I just felt that I was wronged and I wouldn't have been a good father anyway, you know, that day. So to have this chance again and hopefully being a, a good father, which I, you know, I just wanted to be, not like my father, I wanted to be, you know, uh, that father he wasn't really. It was just both over the moon, to be honest. And going for the scan and finding out we had twins, then that was just even, you just can't imagine the relief. It was scary as well, you know, because the, the over, the, over the moon, but sadly we found out they had complications then. And it was that that journey of watching your wife go through so much pain. And, you know, they used to put needles into her like that to drain fluid off her womb. She she wouldn't she didn't mourn or anything, you know. She just and for a man, you just want to swap places, don't you? And you go through the pain, not your missus. Uh, but she she's, I mean, I, I, I keep saying this all the time. She's just an incredible lady, and I wouldn't have been here. You know, and it's easy to say that now, but I, w- I wouldn't have been here today if it wasn't for her. I know I forgot. To, she'll always say you had to do the hard work, and I, I you know I did, but I would I wouldn't have been here definitely. I hadn't met her, like, because I had enough. Uh, and did you, from the scan, did you know they were girls? We knew they were g- girls. They, they, Michelle picked it up more than I did. She kind of sussed there was something not right. Mm. Uh, and we were kind of, they kind of mentioned Down syndrome, but you know what, we didn't care. And if there'd been Down syndrome, I, I wouldn't have cared, uh, Chris, to be honest. But then we had, we had to go, go to another hospital uh, the Birmingham Women's where we found out there was, was twin to twin syndrome. Uh, it's quite complicated trying to explain about that. But back then it wasn't a good thing to have. It's 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 different now where they use lasers, which it makes it, things a lot easier and there's a more survival rate now. But back in two thousand and three there wasn't there wasn't much chance really. Like it was just hope really. But the the people there they just you know and they were just the best people ever. And we were still in touch with some of them. And like I say, I've raised money for that hospital over the years as well. And that's my trying to give something back, really, and just keep the, my daughter's memory alive, really. Like, Because people sadly forget, you know, they see you with two children. They don't see you. I've, I've got four children, you know, and, uh, to Michelle. You know? Yeah. And how was the birth? The birth was we were in... Uh, Birmingham Women's Hospital, it was a 28 weeks, and they decided that the trouble was that Michelle had to be rushed rushed in then. There was no beds in Birmingham, you know, it matters it sounds. Not for twins, there's beds in different hospitals for a single baby, but not, not for twins. So the only hospital that had a bed then was, uh, beds was in the neonatal part in Shrewsbury, which was like 50 miles away. So we had to phone them, and then obviously... To, to get rushed to Shrewsbury, uh, got to Shrewsbury. Michelle was just rushed in. Uh, uh, cesarean. Elana uh, was born born first, and Donna came second. But even even then, Chris, was, they had to get the uh, Michelle what they're getting christened and things because I think she kind of knew more than I did. I was just I'm one of them people. Michelle probably says it's denial, but. I just believe, no, they're going to be all right. They're all going to be all right. I I didn't want to think anything negative. They're going to be all right. They're going to be all right. We're going to be all right. And uh, sadly, Alana took a a really bad turn, really, and she had to be rushed to Birmingham then. So then I had to drive, uh, uh, get to uh, Birmingham. Michelle's dad took me, actually, because my car was still in Birmingham and they had to be with Alana. And I got there just before she got there in the ambulance. I was waiting for Alana. At the ambulance, and that was at the children's hospital. Then we had to go to the children's hospital. Uh, and Michelle was with Dana, 
at Shrewsbury, 50 miles away, and I can only, for a mum, you know, it's hard enough as a dad, but for a mum, I just, I don't know how she done it, to be honest, because uh, it's a sad thing, I don't know, because she was all by herself. It's all just gone terribly wrong, isn't it? Yeah. In the worst, worst. Ma- ma- massively. And Alana, she, 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 you know, she, she was alive for three days. And I remember the consultant, I could kind of see her body was changing just the colour, Chris, on her body, uh, especially her legs. It was almost the blood was shot and they weren't getting to the legs. Mm. And the cult consultant said she's, she's not... She's not going to live. So I had, I had to make that phone call to Michelle. I could, the total haunt me to the day I die, just uh, the, the screams at the end of the phone. And she wasn't allowed to come to Birmingham to Birmingham because she just had the cesarean, but she phoned her dad up. <laughs> she was coming like, and I can remember sitting there with Alana and I could hear this, this crying. Michelle came on the corner with her brother uh, pushing on the wheelchair. So she she got to hold Alana before she died. So, yeah. Gosh. And at that stage, Gary, was it was it a distinct possibility that Dana could could go to? Yeah, that was that because they were both critic. They were, they were both critical. Obviously, Alana was you know and and and. It's probably better words to explain this, but a worse, worse state. Mm. Uh, so then, obviously, Lana died, and you do all the things, you dress her up, and you know, I didn't want them to take her to the morgue. I wanted to take her. it's called like a rainbow room. I wanted to take her there and put her in a little cot. But then I sat there, and I had to leave because Donna was in Shrewsbury. Yeah. So Michelle's uh, brother took us out there. You can imagine that journey it was just, just. Un- un- terrible. I'd phone my best mate because he's he's. You know, if you read the book, you'll see him come prop up a bit. You know, he's like my brother really. Uh, he drove down from the northeast that night to, sp- to spend time with us and help me organise the funeral and all that sort of stuff. Uh, and you know, this obviously you have the funeral. It's just it's just all wrong, Chris. It's it's wrong for any parent. And you you'll notice yourself. It's they're, they're meant to be putting us in the soil, not the other way around, you know. Uh, so you're dealing with all that, and obviously Donna was getting better, and, you know, she's starting to get well, and uh, and I'd be doing... You didn't even have a chance to really grieve in my eyes, myself. You just, you're so trying to hope and be there for Michelle, and, you know, and all, this, all, all that stuff. And, and like I said, you know, she was getting better, and... The day she was getting moved, they, f- they found something wrong with her tummy, with some sort of bug. You know, this, Michelle could tell you the, the exact words. I, I just didn't really want to hear the words, to be honest, Chris. It's just, you know, just told she's, she's not going to live. Uh, mm. And she never, so she never made it out of the hospital. I never made it at all, mate. No. Yeah. And, how was it, Gary, dealing with people? Because I'm, I'm guessing a lot of people probably had no idea what you were going through and then what had happened. No, I mean, I, I, I am absolutely blessed. As much as I never grew up, I was the black sheep of my family, but I'm, I'm, I've got really good friends. And even though I've been away for 20 years from my hometown, I've still kept them friends. I just, they're, they're family to me. Yeah. Uh, they they done their thing at home. Let people they let people know. I mean, I, I, I don't I don't know what part you got to the book, but I I, I phoned my dad. I don't know why I phoned my dad. Yeah, uh, I, I I I had I read that about three times. I was trying to work out had he said something, and then I gather it's just the dynamic that was upsetting you. I well, just exploded, and then uh, I think it just all came out of my dad, and I didn't really know my dad was. He was really ill at the time himself, like, but it just all all came out. Uh, then I kind of thought I'm going to phone my mum now, and my mum had a go at me for being, an, and I just I've never spoke to my mum since. So that day, the day after Alana died, I've never spoke to my mum ever again. I've never seen her, and never will, Chris. 
uh, they didn't turn up to the funerals. And I think in some ways a funeral is not a nice place to be, but you can't build bridges in these these things. And I, that was that was just the end for me with my family. Really, like you know, I, I get why they were the way because I, I was I wasn't a good person when I was little and growing up and things. I brought a lot of trouble to the door. So, I, you know, I can't put my hand up and say that a lot of it was my fault. But you know, I am a different person. I was much as they might have believed. You know, they they had that thing where leopards don't change their spots. Well, this leopard did. You know, uh, but no, I've. I've I'm just I've just been blessed with good friends. Because like you know, like when you look at the time and you'll you'll see that through the through the book. Mm. They were my family. But I did find it difficult to speak to Michelle's family would come in and they're really loving, they're really caring family, you know, like like what you should have as a family, you know, they're there. And that my my answer, yeah, I'm fine. I didn't want to talk about it at all. I'm fine, I'm fine. And I just and I just cut people off constantly all the time. Mm. Uh, and this, then you think you want people to be there for you, but then you don't want people to be there for you at the same time. I couldn't handle it. So I just kind of put myself in my own little world, really, which I've done a lot of times in my, in my life. And I know that's just a survival mechanism, what I've done all my life, really, just to, to get through things. Did you manage to keep the alcohol out of it? Or I struggled that- with that, Chris, because I, I remember coming home one night, I think... I, I think it probably when Alana was in hospital, they sent us home. I didn't want to go home. I went, I didn't, I couldn't sleep. And I had to pour, the, I remember pouring the vodka and that down the, 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 down the sink and that, because I, I feel I could have went right back on it then. And I still have that temptation, you know. I promised Michelle, 1999 I met her, I promised that when we got married, I would do my best to cut me drinking down, mm. and which I have, and I've kept that for, 20 plus years, Chris. I've never been pissed in them 20 years. And, and for somebody, love loved the drink. You know, and the only thing I might have, which maybe sound a bit crazy, I might have a little fruit cider now and again, not just the one. And that's it. I still, I still, I try and avoid pubs and things. I know I have to go to pubs because of occasions. It makes me feel uncomfortable, but I'm blessed with Michelle. I can get, when people get to a certain level with alcohol, whether you know, they're, they're just joking around and having that just disappear. I just go, we usually take two cars. I, I take my car home and Michelle just stay there. But she's, she, she, she doesn't mind that, like, you know. Uh, but for me to not be pissed for 20 years, was, <laughs> it's, a, it's a big old thing, to be honest. Hey, you've done well, mate. That's um, all, all credit to you. Uh, uh, it's just, it's just battles, isn't it? <laughs> Yes, the spiritual battle. Um, I talk yeah. about it a lot now. It's it's um, crazy that it's the most important thing in my life is winning that battle every day, or or at least trying to. You don't you don't always master it every day, but to think that it's something in life that's most people haven't even got a clue exists. Yeah, and that they're certainly not going to teach you at school. No, and, and they'll definitely do it. And it's, you know, like I said earlier, I think with the mental health stuff, I think, you know, a lot of it comes, starts maybe at secondary school and things. It, need, it needs to be when kids walk into the door, really, uh, and learn about mental health and not be the shame of mental health, which, you know, I definitely had. Uh, so, no, it's, that, that's... That's my life now, Chris. It's about banging on and being trying to be an advocate about mental health and for men and things. Yes, and tell us, did you have two more children? Did you say? Yeah, we had. I had a. We had a daughter. Uh, Eleven months later, which seems really quick. Uh, you know, she and she's she's seventeen now, Chris, and bless her, she's had her own battles because uh, mm. she had she's born born with heart problems and things and. Uh, she's severely dyslexic. I'm, I'm dys- dyslexic as well, and she's inherited that. Uh, but she, she's my, you know, she's seventeen, and, and she's got that fighting spirit as well. She, she keeps going. She doesn't give up. You know, and life hasn't been easy for her because of obviously heart problems and different things. Yeah, and she's had bladder problems. I mean, she, 
where, I, where she says I've let her down, I've been overprotected. I know I have. Uh, and I know that's because I'm losing my two daughters. Uh, then we had, we've got, I've got a son. Uh, he's, he's 15. Let's get this right. Next. Was he 15 on Thursday, I think? Uh, and you know, I'm blessed, Chris, because sadly some people lose children and don't have any more children. So I'm blessed to be able to have Aaron and uh, Dara as my son. Uh, so, no, I'm, I feel blessed, mate. Uh, good. Uh, and they're good kids. <laughs> Guys, tell us about your next charity challenge. Let's Let's dive into this one. Uh, I, I'm going to do it for as a charity just outside Burnham. It's called uh, Lily May Foundation. Uh, they lost their, their daughter uh, and they set up a charity in the Lily May. So I'm going to do the Cleveland Way, which will be the end of May. And I'm, I'm going to do it in three days. That's that's three or three, four days probably. Uh, I'll, I'll do that. I kind of set myself probably 30 miles, 25 to 30 miles a day. That's, that's tell us, tell us what that is for those of us. Um, I never go. A, I never go. One hundred and ten mile uh, walk kind of starts in York Channel and ends up on the northeast coast around where Filey is, around that way. Uh, it's not the most difficult walk. The, the one I done uh, a couple of years ago, I done the coast to coast, which you, you'd probably be aware of as well. Mm. And me and my mate done it in seven days. But I, I ended up in hospital after that. I had to the last day. Well, I had to walk on heels for about 20 miles. My feet were just torn to pieces. And by walking on my heels, it's obviously effect, affected my shins as well. So I ended up in hospital uh, and they were concerned because I, I wasn't treating them. I was just popping the blisters as you, as you do, but, you're not, but not looking after them. And, and I kind of got blood, the, the, the poison into my body, really. Uh, but I raised over uh, three and a half grand for, for the charity for that. Uh, and that's what that's that's what, what I, I do. It, it, as much as it's for my daughters, it's 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 good for my mental health as well, which is maybe hard to understand to some people. Why do you put yourself under that? And you you've done a lot more extreme than I have, Chris. But it's it, it's actually pleasurable in some ways. It's a bit perverse that it's it's a sense of, a sense of achievement and and again it's keeping my daughter's memory alive in some way because I chat to them every day. You know, I'll say morning and night and I'll say well I'm struggling here girls you know can you give us a little bit you know yeah so it's well 110 miles in three days that's pushing it yeah I've, I've kind of <laughs> my mate says probably do four days make it a bit more easier on yourself yeah it's not it's not the hardest walk in, in some ways there's a, there's a beginning to start and it's quite well pathed uh, as well Whereas you'll know the coast of coast that, that uh, the Cumbria side's not very, you know, it's your map and compass really. I want to come on and ask you about that. Um, are you going to be sleeping in like dormitories doing this, or or, or? We, if me if my mate does come, we'll probably sleep somewhere because he, he'll he'll not do the camping like uh, uh, on the on the coast of coast we we slept places that, and and you know what as much. Because we want to do as fast as we could, so I kind of you don't even see the walk really. So, but to have a shower or just that bath, you know, we'd get up at four in the morning you, you, uh, just to set off and finish, but then get a cooked meal at the end of it. It was, you know, it was a little bit of a luxury if that makes sense. Mm. So, but I, I don't care how I do if it was if it was wild camping or, or wherever. It doesn't doesn't matter to me really. And have you got a fundraising page set up yet for this one i will i will do chris i'll have, I'll have to speak to uh, the lily may i have to just confirm my mate might not be able to do it so i'll have to do it myself mm. uh, so i just have to make sure what he's doing i'm doing it anyway it'll be the end of may i know that uh, if he can't do it, i'll just i'll just do it myself i've done the last one myself so yeah let us know as soon as you get a fundraising page so we can put it below our our youtube chat no, I'll, 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 I'll do it 100%, mate. Uh, and, you know, you know it's even 50p doesn't matter. If everybody, all your, your viewers get 50p, it's a lot of money, pound, isn't it? Yes. Oh, very much so. And it's it's for a good cause. And they do they do extremely good work. 
it's him and his wife do it, and I think the dad's involved as well. And they do loads of uh, stuff around the, the, the Midlands area and that, you know, for therapy, for for more men to set up an org, you know, for, for men to talk now as well. And I've, I've done a podcast for them a couple of years ago, just as doing what we're doing here, just to talk uh, about what I went through as a dad. And I think when people see a bald head and covered in tattoos, it kind of opens things up uh, a little bit more sometimes to the man's world. Uh, and, you know, me and Michelle, was, before COVID, we were on building sites, we are going on construction sites, talking about mental health and using my story. And Michelle's a glamour part of it. And uh, <laughs> mm-hmm. But she tells a story living with somebody with mental illness because I think that needs to be heard as well and how difficult it is for my wife had to change her life to, to cope with me, if that makes sense. So mm-hmm. she needed therapy to end it as well to find her settled. So... You know, it's 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 just been I'm, it's just been open, isn't it? And just it's quite raw to listen to, but it's that's what I want to do, Chris. It's what I find hard to do, but I I, I want to do it as well. Mm. Uh, but no, that's 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 what I want to do for, for my life, and just get my next book out as well, my life story. Uh, have you thought much about the circle of life? I have, have I, yeah. <laughs> In what, what sense would you say? Well, to take the sting out of death, and, and this goes back to what I was saying about having to reteach myself stuff that yeah. the, my parents' generation never taught us. Yeah. So I kind of come to figure out that we're, we're all made of carbon molecules. Yeah. So you're made exactly the same as me. Yeah. And we're all through this amazing thing called evolution. Yeah. We're all the universe developing. Uh Uh-huh. So essentially, we're actually the universe. We're not, we're universe first. Yeah. We're people second, right? This is just an identity. Yeah. Uh Uh-huh. And it's almost... If you're to think of two rocks on the beach and to give them identity, this one's called John, this rock's called Fred, people would think you're crazy. They say, no, they're just rocks. They're part of the universe, right? That's really easy for people to understand. But because we've been almost like indoctrinated from birth to think that we're this birth certificate identity, I'm I'm Chris, you're Gaz, you're nothing to do with me with the... Yeah. There's actual fact, no, we're the universe experiencing itself, right? Yeah. And the universe is constantly changing form. Yeah. And there'll be new life and there'll be death. And if we didn't have the death, we wouldn't have the new, the new life. Yeah. And so when we think of our loved ones that have gone before us, they haven't actually gone anywhere. They've yeah. just changed the form that they're in. Yeah. And to show you or to example how beautiful this can be, if, if you can get your head, if people can get their head around it, is I was uh, doing some cementing out front with my little boy and this leaf blew past and my little boy went, oh, look, there's granddad, yeah. you know, it's so beautiful. Yeah. That's 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 what I'm trying to instill in him is that, you know, when when we die, we just become a part of the birds, the bees, the the landscape, the sky, the the rain. You know, a carbon monocle. We can't actually go anywhere. We'd, so, no, I I, I I I I do understand that. I know, like uh, for myself, I'm, I'm not a religious person in a sense. I am. I am. I would say it's quite, I'm not spiritual in the sense where I'm right up there with I am learning as, as, as the days, weeks, and months go by. It, it suits who I am, to be honest. And I know I've, I'll find a white feather. And yeah, you could say the birds fly and they fall, but I find a white feather, only one, I don't find two. And I always think that's a lana. Mm. And it'll be in the, the, I even got my car, it was a white feather on the car, and I picked that car. <laughs> That's that's what I, I so, and you find it in the most extreme things where you think, how has that got here? And that's how, and I think so. I, 
whether that seems funny to some people, it keeps me at peace. That's Alana. Uh, Michelle always finds two. And I always think, because I was the one that spent all the time with Alana till she died, I always think it's her because I, she, she, she was first passed, really. And I put every ounce of my body and everything in it to will her to survive, you know. So I think she always comes. She always comes to me like, and that, that's if that's just a hoo ha. It doesn't matter. It keeps me at peace. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. But I, I do believe in that. Like, right I wanted to ask you, Gary, when you did the the coast to coast walk. Yeah. Did you did you go through a place called Chap? I can't. I, I, it doesn't ring a bell. I'm not saying that because. The problem with my mates called Beanie, the problem with us two, we just had heads down and we must, I'd like to do the coast of course again, but do over 14 days to, to, to see it. What, why, why are you asking that? Oh, it's just when I um, ran from John O'Groats to Land's End. Yeah. It's quite a funny circumstance, actually. I had one night, it was really windy, all, like gale force wind. Yeah. And rain to match. And I'm just there in flimsy running gear. I had a, a waterproof, but nothing really substantial. And just as I was about, I was looking over the, there's lots of walls in that part of the yeah. country, aren't there? And there's lots of sheep and yeah. this kind of, this kind of landscape. And I was, I was looking over these rock walls um, thinking, could I pitch my tent there? Could I pitch? I was, basically looking for somewhere it wouldn't blow away because the wind was that strong. And then finally I came upon a light on the edge of a village called Shap. Yeah. And I'd resigned myself to running through the village to then look for a camping spot again, because obviously you can't park on the, on the road. Although I did park a a camp on a few village greens. Yeah. (laughs) And um, as I'm running towards this light, a sign came up and it said, um, oh, it's a backpacker, you know, like a hostel. Right. Can't remember the name of it. And I knocked on the door and I'm thinking, please, please, please. And the guy answered and I said, have you got any rooms? He went, yeah, we've got two people just cancelled. So you've got a four man room all to yourself. I'm like, yes. <laughs> and then he said, broccoli and Stilton soup. Yes. <laughs> and it wasn't till I sat down to breakfast in the morning there that there's a few um, other hikers there and they were all doing this coast to coast thing. And it was the first that I'd ever heard of it. It's, but apparently it's the kind of narrowest point of. Uh, I think, I think it wor- worked out as two, uh, 210 miles. We, we done more than that. And that was only because we got lost. It wasn't. <laughs> Uh, but I think the the whole distance two hundred ten. I think you can do it narrower. You can do it narrower with it if you go on a push bike. Uh, you can definitely do it. I think it's ninety or something. I may be wrong there, but it's not. It's not nowhere near the walking. But uh, it's the hardest thing I've ever done. I know that. I, I know for me, uh, I do want to do it again. But but to, to, to enjoy this time mm. and see the landscape because we me and my pal missed so much of the landscape because it was just heads down. Uh, it consumes you getting to that finish line consumes you doesn't it massively like Mm. uh, you just you just want to get there don't you yes yes you do Gary listen mate it's been absolutely wonderful chatting to you Um, I'm going to the positive here because it's obviously a a terribly traumatic part of your your life and and um and Michelle's as well. But the fact you've come on and you've been so open to talking about it, I can't thank you enough, mate. Oh, thanks for giving us the opportunity, Chris. It really, it really means a lot to me because it gets the word out there still, isn't it? And I just want to keep that rolling. So I really appreciate your time as well, mate. Well, if we can help one person, then we've done our job, haven't we? But I, I know we'll help an awful lot, lot uh, more than that. This will, this will mean a lot to some people. Uh, I know that. Oh, thank you, Chris. Thanks, yeah. Mate. And there you go, friends. I'm sure our, my editor, Luke, will get um, 
a copy of the book cover in the podcast several times. But there we go. Daddy and the Two Bears, available from all good bookshops and obviously Amazon. Yeah, you get definitely Amazon, yeah. Yeah. Grab yourselves a copy. And um, Gary, let's keep in touch. No, I definitely will, Chris. I appreciate your time, mate. Yeah, and give our love to Michelle. I'll do it. Take care, Chris. Bye, mate. Stay on the line, brother, so I can thank you properly. But to our friends at home, thank you for joining us for another another episode of Bought the T-Shirt. I hope you, you got as much out of that as I did. Massive love to you all as well. Please like and subscribe. And we'll see you next time.